evening. My name is Nancy Schiffman, and I'm the Director of Arts and Culture at the Stanford Jewish Community Center. We're thrilled to have you join us tonight for our book and author conversations with Lauren Shapiro, who will speak about his book co-authored with Stephen Nadler, When Bad Thinking Happens to Good People, How Philosophy Can Save Us from Ourselves, moderated by Dr. Betsy Stone. In a world in which irrationality has exploded, when bad thinking happens to good people is a timely and essential guide for a return to reason, showing how we can more readily spot and avoid flawed arguments and um, unreliable information, determine whether the evidence supports or contradicts an idea, and distinguish between merely believing something and knowing it. The book is for sale if you haven't already purchased it, and I'll put it on the website. Uh, I'll put the website uh, in the chat um, with a code. So if you'd like it, we'd love for you to go check out the book. And also wanted to let you know that if you have any questions or comments throughout our conversation, please feel free to put them in the Q&A or in the chat. Um, we're really looking forward to a wonderful conversation. It is my absolute pleasure to introduce Dr. Lauren Shapiro, PhD, the Baron Eng Professor of Philosophy at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, where he has received the Honored Instructor Award multiple times. Professor Shapiro was a senior fellow at the Institute for Research in the Humanities and visiting scholar at La Trobe University in Melbourne, Australia. He was the president of Phi Beta Kappa, University of Wisconsin, Alpha Chapter. His books include The Miracle Myth and Embodied Cognition, and was honored with the American Philosophical Association's Joseph P. Gittler Award for Outstanding Contribution in the Fields of Philosophy of Social Sciences for Embodied Cognition. It always makes for a meaningful conversation to have Dr. Betsy Stone, PhD with us, a clinical psychologist. Betsy is an adjunct lecturer at Hebrew Union College, Jewish Institute of Religion, where her classes include human development for educators, adolescent development, and teens in and out of crisis. She's an experienced teacher in synagogue schools and consults for groups of educators, rabbis and parents, and Jewish professionals across the country. Wow, thank you both for being part of our Stanford JCC book and author series. I so look forward to hearing more about the book, Larry, and hearing what both of you have to say. Um, thank you. I just, wonderful. Betsy, I'm really just going to turn the floor over to you. But again, I want the audience to know if you have any questions or comments, please feel free uh, to put it in the chat or put it in the Q&A. So uh, it's all, the floor is yours, Betts. Thank you so much. And th Larry, thank you so much for being here all the way from Wisconsin. Um, I, I think it, it probably important for us to acknowledge that once again, this is a very complicated day in America um, and that um, so far this week, there have been multiple mass shootings in which I believe 23 people have already died um, and it's only, Tuesday. So I, I, I want us to take a breath um, before we get started. And then my first question for you came up out of Nancy's um, introduction. What is embodied cognition? I know what cognition is. Um, this is what it shrinks know what cognition is. But what is embodied cognition? <laughs> Well, un unfortunately, it's a, it's a term that uh, covers a lot of territory, and you you can have two researchers saying they both work in the field of embodied cognition who have really no research in common. But the the, the general idea is that um, for the past fifty years or so, many cognitive scientists have approached the mind uh, from the perspective of computer science, where the, the mind is something like uh, uh, the, the software that runs on the, the brain's hardware. Mm -hmm. And they've sought to understand the workings of the mind in terms of descriptions of algorithmic processes, just like you have in your, in your, in your computer. And what embodied cognition is, is um, a challenge to this idea. And the challenge comes from 
asserting that the, the body itself, not the brain, but the body itself plays an important role in how cognition works and uh, how, how, how thought is processed. So it, it's a challenge to this computational theory of what minds are, and uh, it puts, puts an emphasis on what bodies contribute to, to thought. So is it consistent with the work, for example, of Bessel van der Kolk, the, the body knows the score, the, his work on trauma and how it's stored in our bodies? I promise actually, you, everybody, I'm going to go back to the book in a minute. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> I, I, I actually don't know this, this, this person's work. Um, it's, it's got um, its, its roots in um, psychologists like J.J. Uh, Gibson, who was a, a perceptual psychologist who spent his year, at, his, his uh, career at Cornell, uh, a Russian psychologist named Vygotsky. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, it's uh, and uh, maybe, maybe George Lakoff, uh, okay. who, who is a political theorist as well as a psychologist. Okay, well, thank you for answering that question for me. Sure. Um, so I, I have read the book and I'm curious about what brought you to write it right now, because it feels frighteningly timely. Yeah. And I so, can't imagine that you were thinking about this. Were you thinking about this before it became timely? No. And in, in fact, uh, this, this book is kind of outside the wheelhouse of, of, both my colleague Steve Nadler, with whom I read this book, and 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 myself, Steve works on um, history of modern philosophy, Descartes, Spinoza. He works on uh, Renaissance figures. He's interested in in Flemish art, and I I'm a cognitive scientist. I work in philosophy of science and philosophy of psychology. Neither of us thought a few years ago that we'd ever write a book like this. But then, I think. Uh, with, with January 6th and the insurrection, uh, we'd reached kind of a, a, a threshold and we decided it, it's, it's time we try to address the irrationality that is just so pernicious, but so also omnipresent in today's society. And so we found ourselves moved by the, the anger we felt at the sorts of things that have been going on in our country. And, and the result was this sort of cathartic experience of, of writing a book. Do you think that this kind of bad thinking is a new phenomenon? Um, I don't think it's a new phenomenon, but I think um, social media has given it a megaphone and a uh, an, an influence that you couldn't have couldn't have anticipated or experienced 50 years ago, say, or even, even 20 years ago. I mean, uh, it, with, 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 with social media, you have this, this way of spreading misinformation that's instant and um, that has a far wider audience than misinformation might have had before the internet. But there has to have been the same kind of um, manipulation of data, of facts um, by people with power historically. Yes, um, uh, certainly. I mean, George Orwell's 1984 is about that precise topic. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, he, he was, of course, writing about, uh, about communism and, and, and figures like, like, like Stalin and, and fascism. Uh, so there, there's always been misinformation. There have always been nefarious characters who will spread lies in order to advance their own interests. But it, it seems that today um, with social media, it's much easier to spread lies. And at the same time we have social media spreading lies, we also have efforts to cut education budgets uh, and, and once you have an uneducated populace whose only source of news is something like Fox News or, or, or Twitter, we have a, a very toxic condition. Uh, and so, so I found myself thinking as I was reading the book um, about No Child Left Behind, about this you know, radical educational experiment, which is I think ultimately an experiment which has failed. Um, where we 
alter education to to really being teaching to the test to the belief in facts and not the belief in thinking um do you see that first of all do you do you think that no child left behind has an impact on the kinds of bad thinking that you see today and then do you what impact do you see in your own students uh, well, I, I like the distinction you're making between memorizing a bunch of facts and actually learning how to think. Uh, one, one of the great pleasures I have in teaching philosophy, uh, I teach a, an introduction to philosophy class every semester. And one of my great pleasures is that I'm introducing a topic to students who have never been uh, never had an opportunity to study philosophy before. So, so students leave high school, entering college, they've had history courses, they've had English courses, they've had language courses, they've had biology courses, but most of them have never had a philosophy course. So I'm the first contact with philosophy that these students have had. And it, it's a struggle for a lot of them because they have to learn that in, in, in a philosophy class, it's not about memorizing a bunch of facts. It's about learning how to think. And uh, for some of these students, the, the scales fall from the eyes and they just end up loving the course. Other students can't stand it. They'd rather have a course where the, the point of the course is, here's a bunch of facts to memorize. Uh, that's what they're comfortable with. So, so I think the, the, the no child left behind policy insofar as it's a policy that just said, here's what you need to know, rather than a policy saying, Here's how you here's how you think. Uh, to that extent, it, it it hasn't been progress. Do you see that then in the in our current political discourse, the implications of no child left behind, or would you are do you think I'm making too um, direct a linkage? Well, I I, th I think what we see, I, I I don't know. I mean, I think that's a good question for. Um, um, people in the education field to, to be working on. Uh, what, what I think I, we, we do see in today's political climate is uh, a too easy embrace of what Kellyanne Conway called alternative facts. Uh, no, no, one, no one who can think clearly ought to be concerned that the election that uh, ended up with Biden's victory was unfair. That there's just no evidence that the election was stolen. And uh, people who believe it don't believe it because they've thought clearly through the issues. They believe it because they've approached the topic with their minds already made up. So is, isn't this then, doesn't this then um, get reduced to a, a quest for power? Um, that in fact, ignorance helps people stay, the ignorance of the populace um, allows for power to be um, centralized in ways that it might otherwise not be. That seems to be true. Um, It, it does seem to be true that um, the people who say continue to support Trump are also people who, whether whether they're genuinely ignorant of the facts or willfully ignorant of the facts, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure. But it's certainly um, ignorance that contributes to a, a fascist or an autocrat's power. I, I agree with you, Betsy, about that. Okay. Thank you. Um, I, I'm just, just as an aside, I want to remind you all that if you have questions, the Q&A is available to you, um, and I want to make sure that people have the opportunity to include that, include questions for us. The, I, I kept, as I was reading, um, I kept thinking about morality and um, in, a, in a number of ways. I think circumstances impact our moral choices. I, I, I'm actually 
probably not comfortable, you know, a psychologist and a philosopher walk into a bar. Um, I'm probably not comfortable with the idea of absolute morality. Um, I don't know, are you? Um, I am, yes. Yeah. Um, and I, I, I think that that, that that circumstances do impact morality. We, we can argue that for a long time. Um, I found myself th thinking about the question of whether or not bad thinking is actually immoral, um, if willful bad thinking is immoral, um, and, and how we braid morality into this question of um, clear thinking, mm -hmm. thinking that's based on reason and logic. Now, yeah. I, I don't think human beings are always based on reason and logic, but yeah, I, I, I throw that at you. What do you think? What's okay. the relationship between morality and thinking? Yeah. So there, there are plenty of circumstances in which bad thinking has no moral consequence at all. So um, uh, my, my sister-in-law, who I uh, love dearly, is a, is a conspiracy theorist and is very superstitious and believes in things like palm reading and, and tarot cards and horoscopes none of which I put any credence in. Uh, so, but, but for the most part, these instances of what I regard as bad thinking are, are, are morally innocuous. It, they, they have no, no serious consequences, but- mm, What if she made decisions based on the tarot cards? Yeah, okay, f f fair enough. I mean, if she decided to divorce her husband because uh, her horoscope said that uh, he's, he's going to be bad to her or something like that, then th that, that would be a, a bad sort of thing. But um, there are, so we, uh, there's a, there was a mathematician and a philosopher named William Clifford, who uh, a 19th century figure, who drew a very interesting connection between rationality and, and morality. And uh, his example involved a, a ship owner who um, ignored the evidence that the ship that he owned was falling apart and sold tickets to passengers who then embarked on a, on a transit across the ocean and the, the ship sank and, and they all died. And, and Clifford points out that this is a case where bad thinking has uh, moral significance because his failure to recognize the evidence led to the deaths of all the passengers. And I think there are lots of instances where, where bad thinking has these sort of moral consequences. We could, we could think about the insurrection again of January 6, mm -hmm. where these people who um, stormed the Capitol because they believed that uh, Trump was legitimately elected ended up killing people and um, threatening democracy, which, which are morally significant actions. So would you put replacement theory in that category? Certainly. Uh, replacement theory has already led to one mass shooting and perhaps today's mass shooting was another consequence of replacement theory. And these are people, it, it, it doesn't take a lot of thought to realize that Jews are not invested in replacing uh, white people with minorities. It's a ridiculous proposition uh, and one that a few minutes of, of thought and reflection would, would show to be inane uh, and, and yet it's led to these horrible slaughters. Are there times when So I, I'm come back to this question of whether or not circumstances actually impact moral choices. I mean, I'm thinking back, and I, this speaks to my age, the, um, the conscientious objector 
tests that they used to give around Vietnam service, mm -hmm. yeah. um, where it, I, the one that I, I remember being told about by a friend of mine um, was this one where there's a bunch of children playing in a playground and you see a man coming to attack them. Would you kill that man to protect the children? And obviously, if you would, you're not a conscientious objector. Um, that seems to me to be um, a, a, a scenario in which um, circumstances change morality. Um, and um, I, I, some of the people who are online right now know that I, for many years, taught a, um, a class to sixth and seventh graders in our synagogue with their parents. And my job was to teach them how to think from a Jewish point of view. One of the questions I asked the kids at one point um, and I asked them to justify their thinking, not to justify their answer, was if you had the ability to kill Hitler when he was six and he had done nothing wrong, would you have taken that, that opportunity? Mm -hmm. um, tell me why there is an absolute morality, even when, even with situations like either of those two. Uh huh. Okay. Um, so by by an absolute morality, what I have in mind is something like um, the idea that there is a right answer to the kinds of moral dilemmas you're you're considering. So whether it would be permissible to kill Hitler at age six, whether it would be permissible to kill a gunman who's approaching a, a group of children on, on, a, on a playground, the, the absolutist or the objectivist as, as they're sometimes known says, there is a right answer to this question. That's different from saying that they know what the right answer is. <laughs> okay. Um, okay, so there are conjectures in mathematics, for instance, um, which have not been solved. Uh, everyone believes that there's a right answer to these conjectures although they may not know what that right answer is. So that's the, the first distinction I'd, I'd wanna make, that uh, you can be an objectivist about morality and still plead ignorance about what the right answer is. Just mm -hmm. as in mathematics, you may not know what the right answer is, although there is a right answer. Um, now, why, why be an objectivist? Well, I think a reason to be an objectivist is because uh, it explains certain facts that uh, seem to be well accepted. So one fact is that we have disagreements with each other about what the right thing to do is. If you were not an objectivist, it would not, not make sense to have any sort of disagreement. Uh, the, the, the contract- Say that to me again, explain that to me. Yeah, sure. So suppose, suppose that's a, you and I had a disagreement about what the best flavor of ice cream was. Oh, we would, because I don't like chocolate. Yeah, then we definitely would. I don't think ice cream <laughs> without chocolate is worth eating. Uh, but it seems clear that in this sort of discussion, we recognize that this is a difference of opinion. Mm -hmm. And it makes no sense for me to try to convince you that chocolate is the best flavor, right? And, and you would never be able to convince me that vanilla is or, or butter pecan or whatever your, your preference Malt. is. Malt, malted Malt. vanilla. Malt, oh, well, that's good. Um, <laughs> Add some chocolate and I'll eat it. <laughs> On the other hand, I think we do when arguing about a, an ethical issue, say about uh, whether abortion should be permissible. I think what we take ourselves to be doing is actually having an argument about what the right answer is, unlike in the ice cream case. Uh -huh. uh, now, the best explanation for why that's the case is because there is a right answer. So that's But we don't know what it is. But we don't know what it is. Um, and another well, why can't is, we have different right answers even when that we know even when we believe there is a right answer? Well, there can be only one right answer, right? Th um, and, th and that rule just is that's just a rule. Well, um, think about again the comparison to mathematics. Uh, I say that two plus two equals four. That's the right answer, and it doesn't make sense to say, well, why can't we have different right answers? It's because <laughs> There's an objective fact about the, the matter, and the right answer is the answer that identifies that objective fact. So that circumstances don't 
matter? Well, they matter a lot, um, but they don't change what the right answer is. So the, the case you discussed, uh, would it be okay for a pacifist, a conscientious objector, that was your case? Yes. To, 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 to shoot a, uh, a murderer approaching a group of children on a playground. It seems to me that um, the, the pacifist ought to say, well, in that circumstance, it seems to me they, they might be wrong because we can be wrong about objective facts. It seems to me that the right thing to do would be to, to, to kill the murderer, but that's not uh, an objection to pacifism or to conscientious objection. A conscientious objector is not objecting to uh, killing someone who's clearly in the wrong. They're objecting to engaging in war for reasons that they regard as not as not um, sufficient. Right. Um, that was a test that was used around Vietnam, and it yeah. was used to determine that somebody was actually considered. Then the, the government would say, "Well, you're not a pacifist. Right. Um, if you if you'd yeah. be if you'd be willing to take a life in any circumstances, then you should take a life in a, in a circumstance where your country has asked you to do so, um, right. which is." I suppose then layers on um, the morality of obedience and the morality of um, of nationalism onto the morality of the situation. Yeah. Sure, that makes sense. That makes sense. And let, let me give you another argument for why I think that morality is objective. Um, I think um, you're probably I'm not, not going to convince me of this. I'm just warning well, you. Okay. Well, <laughs> let, let me see how you react. To okay. That. Okay. Uh, it seems to me that it makes sense to talk about moral progress. So I think that um, I think that slavery was wrong, and I think that when slavery was abandoned, the country made moral progress. I think that uh, the Holocaust was wrong, and uh, I think that the recognition that genocide should not be committed is 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 progress. So I regard. Uh, the movement away from, from slavery, the movement away from genocide as marking moral progress. Now, if you thought that there was no objective morality, it wouldn't make sense to um, regard these things uh, re regarding, say, the end of slavery as moral progress, because what you'd have to say is, well, slavery was right for the time, and now it's wrong for the time. So it was, it's not a, a move toward better morality when we give up something like slavery. But the objectivist gets to say, there's a fact of the matter about whether slavery was right. Uh, the fact of the matter is, I think, that it was wrong. And so today, without slavery, we're living in a morally superior world. Oh, boy. Do you think that the family of George Floyd feels that way? I'm not sure. Um, maybe morally superior, but f far from morally oh, just. Oh, for sure. Yeah, I mean, um, we have a way to go. But the fact that we can talk about there being a way to go suggests that there's some end there toward which we should be um, trying to achieve. Um, so then why do you think we continue to return to, I'm being cautious, but I'm gonna say it, immoral behavior. What we see in Ukraine, um, what we saw today in Texas, what we saw in Buffalo earlier this week, what is it about immoral behavior that tempts us so deeply? Because in fact, there's many more people who engage in bad thinking than engage in immoral behavior. That's true. I, I don't see Kellyanne Conway going and shooting up, shooting people, but in fact, she clearly engages in bad thinking, or at yeah, least she's immoral. willing to have us think that. Yeah. Yeah. I also think that she's immoral in the bad thinking that she engages in. Um, but there, well, so there, you'll go go to that second and, and help me understand why people, why certain people engage in immoral behavior as a result of bad thinking and others do not. Yeah, well, uh, is it, 
Is, is that what you'd like me to address first? Uh, uh, e either one, whichever moves you first. Okay. Um, okay, let's first talk about your, your general question about um, instance, uh, instances like the, the war in Ukraine, where we have people clearly engaging in immoral behavior. Why do, why do people continue to engage in immoral behavior? And I think the answer is because many people are just not very good people. Um, there are people who are incentivized to behave immorally, and they will put their own interests in front of the interests of others. Uh, and that's, that's wrong. There are bad people in the world, though, and that's a fact of life, I think. Uh, now, Kellyanne Conway in particular, I think she's immoral because I think she has aided and abetted Trump in all of his uh, evil exploits. So that the people who, who support um, evil, that's a, such a strong word. Would you use the word evil to describe um, the Russian soldiers? I guess I would use the word evil to describe the Russian soldiers who, who are raping and murdering civilians. Okay. Yeah, I think that's a good description of them. So there's, there's a place in the book where you say that human beings are moral animals. I went back and forth and back and forth and back and forth about that. Um, I am convinced that other mammals have some moral consciousness um that i mean you know that elephants will save the offspring of other elephants um even though it serves them not one whit from a from a um from a darwinian point of view i mean mm -hmm. we know that um there's been wonderful research looking at primates primates understanding of fairness mm -hmm. um and just i'm gonna just tangentially share this with some people in, in who are listening. Um, and you can obviously expand on this if you have other ideas. But um, there's these there's this research that somebody did where they had primates in cages next to each other and they had to perform some activity. And if they performed the activity, they got a reward and the reward is almost always food. Um, and at some point, the researchers started giving the, the two primates who could see each other different quality food. Um, and the primate who got the lower quality food would, be, would become enraged, throw the food out of the cage. Um, and very often the primate that got the higher quality food would share it. Now that sounds to me like moral behavior. Mm -hmm. Would you call that moral behavior or does moral behavior demand cognition? Um, well, I think it does demand cognition, but I think there's a case to be made that these uh, uh, that these apes were have cognition, I'm and that their understanding of fairness is um, is a moral question. I I I'm tempted by that. Yeah, I think that uh, now there's as 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 you you know there's been a a, a num there have been a number of books and articles written by uh, primatologists. Uh, who have sought to understand the moral minds of chimps. Mm -hmm. uh, and when, when we say that uh, humans are, are moral animals, we don't want to, uh, we don't take that to entail that uh, there are moralities uh, within the sphere of humanity only. So what's the relationship then between cognition and morality? Uh, so if, if you think about the sorts of organisms that we don't regard as moral, things like chickens and, and cats. Uh, Although uh, cats probably do have a sense of fairness, don't they? I don't think I, I'm so. not a cat person. Dogs have a sense of fairness. <laughs> maybe, maybe. But... I think one of the conditions that's required for, for something to be moral is that they recognize that they're doing something right or wrong, fair or unfair. If they don't have the power 
to recognize that certain behaviors uh, are, are bad, then they can't be regarded as moral. So, so we, don't, we don't think that the hyenas that uh, kill the baby rhinoceros uh, have, have done something wrong, although they might have done something uh, that we regard as, as, um, as destructive. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But they don't, they can't possibly understand that some actions they take might be wrong and some actions they take might be right because they, they, they just don't have those concepts. And without those, and they require cognition to have those sorts of concepts. Yeah, uh, right. And we, and I assume that hyenas have cognition because they hunt in packs. So that, right. that, that implies some kind of cognition. Yeah. Um, and one could, now I'm coming back to my, my question that morality is relative to kill the baby rhino to, per, to feed your own children, your own offspring. Is that, right. a, is that a different is that different from a moral point of view or is it still? Yeah, so, so it's just sort of a, a sad fact that animals need to kill animals in order to survive. Uh, what I would regard as uh, immoral is whether, you know, if you could prevent the suffering of the animal that you need to kill, but you choose not to. Mm -hmm then that strikes me as immoral. So or if you kill arguments for, for vegetarianism are, are arguments in many cases where we think that it's immoral to eat animals. The vegetarian would think it's immoral to eat animals because the animals are, are suffering so much. So think about a situation like this where you are able to breed an animal that never gains consciousness and then eat it. I think a lot of vegetarians might say there's nothing wrong with that because uh, although you're eating the animal, it's never suffered. So the relationship between morality and suffering is a profound one. Yes. Okay. Yeah. I think a lot of moral codes emphasize the importance of, of not causing suffering. Okay. So then I want to come back to... Um, you, this may feel circular. I want to come back to some of the white supremacist stuff, which feels to me to be purely evil thinking. Yes. And and yet, um, based on a sense of threat to survival. Now, we might argue that there is not that real threat to survival, although there is a threat to power. Is the threat to does the threat to power have a similar moral valence as the threat to survival? Uh, it, it seems to for a lot of people. There's this assumption that that white supremacists and replacement theorists, which is a, a term I was unfamiliar with two weeks ago, yes, um, as in which these people feel like their survival is threatened if they're no longer in power, if they're no longer the, the ruling members of society. Uh, and it, it mystifies me that, that people should, should feel this way. Uh, now, what, what's peculiar is that these people are so afraid of being a minority all of a sudden. And then the obvious question is, why is that? Is that because minorities are treated as less than equal? <laughs> Maybe you should think about that. Right, uh, right. But that's a level, that's way more thinking than Kellyanne Conley may want you to do. <laughs> yeah, right, or Tucker Carl, Carlson. Right, right. So Patricia asks the question, why do you think there are people who still don't believe, do not believe that January 6th was an insurrection? Why are there people who think that who believe it was a just a little bit of a, a little gathering or whatever they're now saying um, on that side of the aisle. Why is it that people don't believe it? That in in what seems to us to be such blatant truth? Yeah. So that's a that's a great question. And um, philosophers have thought about whether factual ignorance could ever. Um, 
could ever remove culpability. So a, a case of factual ignorance might, might be something like this. Uh, you're unaware that the, uh, the, the sugar that you're giving a friend to put into her tea is actually arsenic. And so you end up. <laughs> that would be friend. a problem if I. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So you end up killing your friend. And it seems like you're not culpable because you didn't know that the what you thought was sugar was actually arsenic. And then we have uh, factual ignorance in the case of something like you, you hear people saying, well, they didn't, you know, slave owners say they didn't realize that uh, Black people were. Um, uh, capable of that black people were genuinely human. And so they didn't regard slavery as actually uh, uh, pernicious in any sort of way. And then you've got January 6 people who might say, well, we, we didn't, we, we honestly believe that Trump won the election. And so our insurrection was not an insurrection, it was a legitimate political protest. Okay, so what's the difference between the, the, the slave owner who denies denies uh, the, the, that, that black people are actually human beings and, and the insurrectionist who, who denies that, uh, that Biden won the election fairly versus the person who mistakes arsenic for, for sugar. Well, the difference is there's so much easy to come by evidence that black people are indeed human beings and easy to come by evidence that Biden in fact won the election fairly that the best explanation for why the slave owner continues to believe that blacks are not human or that, uh, that Trump won the election is that they simply want to believe that it's convenient for their own. And it's, it's so many apologies for that. Second. Many, many apologies. I'm glad everybody is resourceful, good, quick thinking, uh, got right back on. No, no bad thinking here. All right, let me. <laughs> okay, let me, so I, I so I, I another question, um, uh -huh. and um, I'm gonna just try to recover. So uh, one of the things that I thought about, um, and it probably has a lot to do with the times that we find ourselves in, and my own um, sense of how important community is, um, and how damaged community has been over the last two years. I found myself thinking as I read the book that given that human beings need community, live in community, what is the impact of doubt on thinking? Because if I, if the community believes this and I begin to question it, I have, I am at risk of losing community. I'm at risk of it being seen as a traitor, as a betrayer. Um, and I, I've, I found myself thinking of um, um, the people who li leave Lubavitcher communities, for example, um, that sometimes I have to, in, I might feel a pressure to engage in bad thinking because it's the only way to stay connected with other people. Um, how many of us, had we found ourselves in that crowd, would have been able to turn around and say, this is crazy. Now, I wouldn't have found myself in the crowd, but leaving the community is, feel, I think often feels so dangerous and threatening. Yeah, that's, that's a, a great question. And I don't think I have a, a, a good answer to that. I think that it's unfortunate that some communities engage in this kind of litmus test of thought. So uh, after, after I wrote my, my book called The Miracle Myth, I was invited to participate in a lot of debates with evangelical Christians about, about the about belief in miracles. Um, and I'd be the kind of village atheist who they would trot out to be defeated by the uh, evangelical um, uh, minister. And 
I, I knew I was the sacrificial lamb. I'd be invited to, uh, you know, Christian colleges where, where no one was there because uh, they, they were free thinkers who <laughs> might take honestly the, the challenge to their faith that I was presenting to them. Um, and yet, I would, I would always get an email from some student afterwards saying, thank you so much for giving this talk. I've never heard an atheist speak before, and you've really expressed my own thoughts about this. And I'm really worried about how to stay in my community with these sorts of thoughts. And it's just, it's just terrible that there are communities that have a kind of list of conditions of things you need to believe in order to remain a member of that community. I think but a I think lot of also, communities have that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and the Lubavitchers, the Amish, there, there are plenty of examples. Right, and they're not only religious communities, they're, that, they, right. That, that, that's right. But on the other hand, I think there are communities that are more open. I think actually Jewish communities are, are, are can be distinguished from evangelical communities in the sense that they're much more willing to argue with each other about certain, I mean, yeah, we're we're Jews here. We know that here we are. Argument is life <laughs> right. blood, right? Right. Um, uh, and and there is no uh, in 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 more progressive Jewish communities, there is no sort of hard and fast code that you must observe um, to be a member of that community. I think within within bounds. I you know so it's interesting. I. I I'm not speaking personally here, but I wonder whether there are people for whom um, the issue, for example, of abortion is less clear, but mm -hmm. who have to protect their questioning in our communities. Um, I, my guess is that th this sense of litmus test exists in pretty much all communities we live in um, and that the questioning of the litmus test is a pretty dangerous behavior. Yeah. Um, and, and so it, it raises for me this question of um, the impact of doubt, um, the power of doubt. Um, it kind of takes us a little bit back to No Child Left Behind. Um, to the, the, the question of, of, of the value of the struggle as opposed to the value of the answer. Yeah. Um, well, you're, you're expressing a very Socratic idea, this idea that the, the, the good life is the life in which you, you spend examining your beliefs. Uh, and of course, Socrates, Socrates' life did not end well. Uh, yeah, he, he died for that. Executed <laughs> precisely because he was doubting the sorts of things that the community thought should never be questioned. It, it also does seem to me that the ability to um, engage in that kind of intellectual dialogue is for many, it might be perceived as a form of privilege in and of itself. I mean, you and I are not parents who are working three jobs and um, worrying about what happens if, if the tire blows. Um, and so it does seem to me that at some level, the, the, the opportunity for intellectual discourse, which I love, um, and clearly so do you, is in some sense a form of privilege in and of itself. Certainly. Um, right. I, not, not only do I have the, the leisure to, to follow the intellectual pursuits that interest me, I, I'm actually paid to do it. Uh, so I'm very privileged and yeah. I, I try not to take that for granted. Uh, right. Right. So, I found my um, self wondering, and then this is probably going to be my last question. Um, we'll see. I found myself wondering as I read the book about what is the power and impact of intention on bad thinking? Um, 
if I am, if I, if, if my intention is not bad thinking, but membership in a community or, um, or being a good girl, um, does intention, the intention of my thinking matter? There's, um, there's some really interesting research, I, I can't think of who did it, um, that says that when we evaluate other people's behavior, we evaluate it based on the impact and the way we see their behavior and we evaluate our own selves based on our intention. So I didn't mean to hurt your feelings, so I should get a pass, but you hurt my feelings and therefore don't get a pass. Um, and I, so I find myself thinking about the power of intention and the impact of intention. Yeah, I, th I think it takes a, a strong amount of self-reflection to recognize when your, your, your thinking should be the subject of criticism. So, no one, I think, intends to think badly, but circumstances might make it very difficult for them to think any other way. Uh, so imagine the sorts of families where uh, it's, it's just a, a, a given that, uh, that Jesus is God and that uh, we, we ought to dedicate our lives to a certain interpretation of the, of, of the Christian Bible. Uh, and how do, you, how do you break out of that kind of cage that, mm -hmm. that you're raised in? It's, it's a very hard thing to, to think critically and, and to engage in the kind of self-examination that allows you to to expand your 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 world of thought and is the inability to do that the choice not to do that would you consider that an immoral thinking would you consider that bad thinking i i think um i think to answer that question we'd have to look at particular sorts of instances so so the person who's the, the child who's raised in a racist household and is taught to believe that blacks are inferior or that women are not as smart as men. I, I think to maintain that belief uh, is in some sense blameworthy because there's so much evidence contrary to these sorts of thoughts Unless you live in a part of the country where you don't encounter people of color. Uh, yeah. I mean, it's be hard to live in a part of a country where you don't encounter women, but, yeah, right. um, but you could, or you could, if you lived in a, in a, in a black community, think that white people are evil and not, I mean, at, and potentially have some basis for that in, in history. Right. Yeah, I mean, there are circumstances where someone might be so closeted that they're never able to sort of see the truth. But but notice where we're going here, Betsy. It, it seems like you're now agreeing with me about objective morality. No, I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, I'm not going to go there. So, so okay. Nancy. <laughs> And I don't like chocolate. Um, so Nancy says that I'm supposed to, at this point, say to you, so tell me one last thing. Tell me what you want us all to take from your work. What should we be thinking as we leave our laptops and, uh -huh. and move back into whatever we're doing? Well, uh, a couple messages. I mean, this is a this is a book that seeks to um, elevate the role of philosophy in in today's discourse because philosophers uh, have, have been trained to to sort of step away from ordinary ways of thought and 
and, and to question basic assumptions. And you don't need training in philosophy to do this, I think. What you need is a kind of epistemic humility, uh, a kind of recognition that it's hard to, to come up with the right answers. And if you think you have the right answers, you should start wondering whether what it would what the world would look like if if you were wrong, and uh, approach all topics that way. I think, and you might end up just sort of coming to the same belief you had in the first place, but it would be better justified and um, stand on firmer grounding if you if you were willing to question it in the first place. So, so the take home message I think is we all need to be more humble about what we think we know, what we think we're justified in believing, uh, and, and willing to approach the sorts of beliefs we have from, from all different perspectives. There's a Miss Frizzle quality to this, um, <laughs> <laughs> which I truly love. So thank you. Um, I want to thank uh, Nancy. I, 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 are you coming back on or am I doing these thank yous? I want to make sure I do this correctly so that I, my thinking is considered good. <laughs> so I noticed that there is, first of all, thank you both. Really wonderful conversation, really raised some wonderful ideas. And I did see that there is something in the Q&A, Betsy. So I don't know if you want to take I a look. I, I did see it. Um, it's a question from Alan and it says, so why do you think a national defense education initiative will work in the incredibly divided society we have today? 1958 was a very different environment after the nation came together to win World War II. Um, and I, I, can't, I don't know the answer to this question. Um, do, you want to do you want to tackle it? I don't, I don't know the answer either. I, I don't, yes. I, so Alan, I, we, we were confused. Um, <laughs> and so in, in deference to um, Larry's avoidance of bad thinking, we are not going to answer a question we don't understand. <laughs> <laughs> it's also my 35th anniversary today, and I'm going to go out to dinner with my wife now. Go enjoy. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. Thank you both again. This was really fantastic. And I want to thank the audience for hanging in there with us, first of all, with a couple of those glitches. I'm so glad that you came back. Um, and uh, I hope you end up joining us for yet another book and author conversation, this time with David Page, a two-time Emmy Award winner and creator of Diner, Drive-Ins and Dives. Very different kind of topic. Um, <laughs> he did a lot of food shows. So if you're a foodie like me, uh, please join us on June 16th uh, in person at the JCC or via Zoom. We're gonna have both options available for folks. Uh, Thursday, June 16th at 7.30 p.m. We also have a wonderful art and wine reception um, for our new exhibit, How Beautiful the Universe, featuring photographic work by Westport Astronomical Society. It's out of this world. Uh, on Tuesday, <laughs> June 14th at 7 p.m., also at the JCC. Um, and again, thank you both. Really delightful conversation, a lot to think about. And uh, thank you all for being with us. And hope you enjoy the rest of the evening and happy anniversary, Larry. This is wonderful. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Great questions, Betsy. Thank you so much. Bye. Good night, everyone. Bye.